Hi gang, welcome back to Ghostly Activities. I'm your guide, Jacob Rice. Over the past month or so, I've hemmed and hawed about the format for the podcast. Would I focus on dark haunted history, like lore, if you're familiar with that one, or debunk a bunch of urban legends and famous ghost stories? Well, while I was researching and writing about those subjects, I gotta say they started to bore me. <laughs> you see, a lot of the haunts had very similar themes and narratives, and it went something like, Person X lived here for X number of years and lost X number of children to disease or murder, and then they killed themselves. I kid, I kid, I kid. But you get where I'm coming from. So what I've done is I've decided to do neither, and I'm going to go back to my roots and focus on my ghost hunts, ghost hunting techniques, things investigators need to know, but I'm not going to abandon the other topics altogether. Um, so if you stick around after I run through the variety of topics, I've got my very first paranormal encounter to tell you about, and it's a tale I've only told a few close friends. Now for the topics for this revamped, reset version of ghostly activities, I'll still tell true ghost stories. I mean, this is a podcast about ghosts and hauntings, right? You can't just abandon ghost stories. <laughs> Uh, and as I mentioned, I'll go over ghost hunts, uh, my personal encounters, TV reviews, because you know I'm a ghost hunting paranormal reality TV junkie, <laughs> equipment reviews. I'll also interview other ghost hunters, and I'll do more interviews with folks skilled in paranormal protection. And one of my favorite things is doing profiles of haunted places. I call these my favorite haunts. <laughs> And famous ghosts. So these are like the Bloody Marys of the world, maybe Hookmans, verging into urban legend status. I call these ghostly spotlights. And it's all in good fun, too. Okay, so I've prattled long enough. I hope you're still here. <laughs> because I've got my very first paranormal story to tell you about. And like I said, I've only told a few close friends about that one. So let's cue up the intro music and get into the tale. This one takes place outside a little town along the Wisconsin River, not far from Madison. It's about 30 miles north. It was December 21st, the winter solstice, as I heard on the morning news. The darkest day of the year. And I just knew I was on break from school for a few weeks. See, most kids like kindergarten, but I didn't. There's too many whining brats that stop me from drawing and coloring my monster stories. I take my violet crayon and draw them fuzzy with big white bloodshot eyes, and they always had long black claws and blood. Blood stained on those claws and dripping in the snow. <laughs> what can I say? I was a horror fan at five. The teachers gave my picture some odd looks and suggested I draw a superhero, a car, or a pet. But I'm thinking to myself, no thank you. Those are boring. And then I'd hold up a picture and say, check out this gargoyle. <laughs> So home for me was a two-story farmhouse, and it was on a low hill with a single maple tree and an old well out front. My bedroom looked right over the top of both of them, and on the house, the white paint had started to chip off. My parents agreed to paint it in the spring when things warmed up. So surrounding the house was about 20 acres of cornfields, and they were all on the side of the hill. Behind us, there was a big, dark forest and a row of trees separated our property line from our neighbors. At this time of year, because it's winter, the corn had been harvested, but the area looked kind of like lumpy cotton under a few inches of snow from the dead stalks. But we didn't farm the land. That land belonged to our neighbors, the Bentleys. They had cows, sheep, and pigs, too. The sheep, though, were escape artists, and they got out of their pens or barn, and then they'd just stroll into our yard, and my dog, Grizz, short for Grizzly, would love to nip at their heels and herd them. She was a collie, and a big one at that, because I could ride her back like a horse. My dad, Ray, was a mechanical engineer by trade. He opened a tool and dye business and did most of his work in the basement or one of the old barns. He had converted one into a shop for the biggest equipment that he had. So when you walked in, you could see these red, green, and yellow clamping, pressing, and drilling machines all lined up in a row. It smelt like oil and the remnants of an electrical fire in a shop. There was nothing flammable around, no wood chairs or desks, just the wood walls. 
The concrete floor had black spots from the oil pools, and it reminded me of a Dalmatian's coat. The day started clear with a pale blue sky, and the sun looked white, it was so bright. Winter is so cold here that it pushes the clouds away. You're thankful when a snowstorm comes because it has to warm up. That morning, the weathermen said a blizzard approached and there could be as much as 18 inches of snow. So my mother, Bonnie, heard that and put down her coffee and cigarette. She was on the phone with my grandma. And groceries, gotta get some groceries before the storm arrives. And this is an important thing to know about Wisconsin. There are a lot of little rural towns and country roads don't get plowed often in winter. You put sand on the slick parts and you chain your tires for traction. Our road was a half mile long gravel driveway going up that low hill. A challenge for a plow to get through and even more so for a car. And if you didn't stock up before the winter storm hit, you may not get to town for a week. So my mom put me and my two older brothers in the back of a green Ford station wagon, you know, the kind with the wood paneling on the sides, and Dayton myself. (laughs) And this tank of a car got about eight miles to the gallon, (laughs) but it had some hauling power, let me tell you. And we got to the Piggly Wiggly grocery store just fine. And it was packed with people, too, getting food, coffee, milk, and batteries. You know, all the same stuff you'd see for a storm. But on the way home, the weather changed, and big fluffy flakes, like you see in Christmas movies, floated down from the sky. Bonnie had my older brother George help clear the windshield, and the flakes were sticky and wet. That meant the blizzard could have a lot of sleet, and it would be more like an ice storm. We lived about 15 minutes outside of town, a place called Sauk City, and the wind picked up as we left and those big flakes splattered on the windshield. And my mom had the wipers cranked up and they struggled to keep the glass clear. The car turned up the hill to the house and Bonnie hit a slick spot. It caused the back end to fishtail, but she got it under control and we inched up the hill. And I thought for sure we'd slip backwards, but we made it, grabbed the groceries, and I could feel the sleet hit my chubby red cheeks, and it stung. The storm came barreling in about a half an hour later, and when you looked out the window, you saw gray roiling skies and ice clattered on the glass. The power would flicker on and off, and sometimes lights would dim, sometimes they'd just flicker, and a few times they went out. We had a fireplace with wood stacked twice as tall as my five-year-old self, and I wasn't worried about getting cold, If I did, I just snuggled Grizz and put on my snowmobile suit and moon boots. It was about 9 p.m. when my dad took me upstairs for bed. My room had universal monster posters on the walls, toy race cars scattered on the floor, and a Star Wars comforter on my bed. I also had the window that looked over a maple tree and old well, and the well looked more like a pit, and my dad had knocked down the wall to help fill it in. Ray built a fence around it so my brothers and I couldn't get close to it. He'd been filling it in off and on over the summer and fall, but it was still pretty deep. And my mom said we had a troll living in it. She called it Oogalaga, and it ate misbehaving boys. (laughs) Yes, fear was an integral part of me being a well-behaved child, but we also had Marky the Elf, who'd report me to Santa if I were bad. The storm continued through the night, and when I heard thunder and a flash of lightning. You don't usually think of snowstorms having thunder and lightning, This would be closer to what we call nowadays a (laughs) snowpocalypse. And it woke me up, and I went to my window and looked out. And the corners of the pane had collected the snow and ice and obscured my view, but the porch lights strained, but they lit up the area under the tree, and snow whizzed by, making it hard to see as well. The wind may have blown over the fence, and it got buried in the snow. Over a foot must have fallen by now and I could still see the well's dark opening. As I watched the lightning flash through turbulent clouds, I saw a sheep come up to the tree. Then another, and another. Farmer Bentley's barn door must have given way. Sometimes it came loose during storms, and he always said he'd get around to fixing it one day. Today was not one of those days. (laughs) It took about ten minutes for the area under the tree to fill with sheep, They all huddled together and the storm bore down on them. The snow clung to their fur and they looked like giant cauliflower florets. There was no real shelter under the maple tree. All the leaves were gone, just icy branches jutted out. One of the sheep got pushed out from the group 
and it came close to the well's edge. It turned and looked into the big black opening and started to buck, but it lost its footing and fell down. A black bony hand reached up and grabbed the sheep's back leg right above its hoof and yanked it. Now the sheep wiggled and kicked and twisted trying to get up, but I saw red in the snow. It got cut by something. I couldn't hear it scream, but I saw its mouth open wide like it was calling its flock. The other sheep backed away, but the deep snow kept them from running. They could barely lift their legs, and the snow was beyond their bellies. The hurt sheep continued to thrash and try to get away from the thing that was gripping it when the monster pulled itself out of the well. It looked black, skeletal, with elongated forearms and short legs. The snow didn't collect on it. It's like the ice just bounced off of it. Then it raised its free hand, putting its long, knotty fingers together like an axe blade, and swung it down into the sheep's stomach. The snow turned black from the sheep's blood. It convulsed a few times, but the monster kept it held down. And in a minute or two, the sheep stopped kicking. The black monster with the long fingers and longer arms pulled it into the well, leaving a bloody smudge in the snow. The herd now scattered, and I screamed for my dad. He opened the door asking if I was okay, and I pointed out the window. When he saw a dozen of sheep jumping and burrowing through the snow, I tried to tell him about the monster, but he cut me off. He yelled to my mom to call the Bentleys and muttered something about one of our old barns. And the next thing I knew, Dad and Grizz were outside in the storm, chasing down scared sheep. He'd grab one by its wool and drag it kicking into his shop. Grizz would race around a few of them at a time, nip their butts to move them, and they went on and on until they got about half the sheep into my dad's shop. The others just ran away into the stormy night. By breakfast the next day, the storm had ended. Nearly two feet of snow had fallen, and the drifts were deep enough to bury me. I brought up the sheep that got dragged into the well, but my dad said it probably fell in, and I imagined a monster. And my mom, she just went along with this explanation. Farmer Bentley came by around lunch, and he found five or six sheep that ran away. Half of them died in the storm. They would need to wait a day or two for the roads to clear up before the farmer could haul them back to his property. My dad let Bentley know that he'd be shoveling sheep shit for a week and that the farmer owed him. Then my dad signaled Bentley over to the well, and they looked down the shaft and saw the sheep. It was buried in snow about 12 feet down, and only its head stuck out. My dad got a rope and put a ladder in the shaft. He'd been filling it in with rocks, and the bottom was actually good and steady for the ladder. And after my dad roped the sheep's head, he went back up to help Bentley pull its body. The two men gave the rope a heave, and the sheep started to come up easily. A little too easily. Bentley, a man about 60 with Coke bottle glasses and deep laugh lines, paused as the sheep came over the edge. And he stopped and yelled at me and my two brothers, and he told us to go inside. My dad took a look at the sheep. And he just looked at us and said, do what Bentley said. And then they finished pulling it up. From inside, my brothers and I saw it. Its belly was cut smoothly open, like it had been dressed like a deer. And one back hoof was shorn off like someone cut the bone with a saw. Bentley covered up the sheep with an old tarp from my dad's shop. And my dad, well, he told my mom and brothers a black bear got it. But to me... He asked me to describe the monster. Thanks for listening to this episode of Ghostly Activities. If you like it, please tell your family and friends about it. Subscribe, share it on the socials. Just in general, let everyone know that, you know, it was a good time. <laughs> I'd appreciate it a great deal. So I'll be back next weekend with a fresh new episode of Ghostly Activities. Take care. <laughs>